In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Today is three years since the first time I visited your community here at the invitation of Father Jacob. Now, Father Jacob patiently and persistently invited me as his brother and friend to come and see, to visit this community dedicated to St. John Maximovich, to which he dedicated his entire life. St. John became the wonder worker. St. John the wonder worker became the patron of this community, a patron whom Father Jacob dearly loved, and in his style, eventually acquired a relic of St. John Maximovich. Now, preceding most of us by a generation or two, St. John, in comparison to the holy apostles, is a contemporary saint. His festival, the day of his repose, follows that of Saints Peter and Paul and the Twelve Apostles. And therefore today, we will take as our cue, as it were, the Apostles. Soon after the repose of his wife, Saint Innocent of Alaska, then the priest John Vinyaminov, traveled to the Russian capital, Petersburg, from Alaska. There he met the senior hierarch of the Russian Orthodox Church at that time, St. Philaret of Moscow. And St. Philaret, encountering him, meeting him for the first time, said to a friend, there is something apostolic about that man. Now, St. Innocent was a rather imposing figure tall, steady, strong. He had nearly sailed around the globe, authored several books, invented alphabets, mastered languages, explained the faith to people of all, from all walks of life, and even attained the respect of the Academy of Sciences. Leading intellectuals of his time <coughs> sponsored the publication of his writings. And themselves eventually took upon, the, then took upon themselves the responsibility for raising his children. Now, St. John the Wonder Worker cut quite a different figure from that of St. Innocent of Alaska. He was slight of stature, appeared disheveled, even spoke with a lisp. His writings were confined to small church bulletins. And the work we know, the Orthodox Veneration Mother of God, only became well known posthumously. St. John, though physically short, was a spiritual giant. His actions were daring. He was ready at a moment's <coughs> notice to cross boundaries for the sake of his flock. He kept vigil while the world slept. He fasted while others ate. He visited the sick, while others socialized and made merry. Diligent, insistent, attentive, he noticed every mistake, every omission, every careless step that occurred around him. But he did not humiliate his neighbor, but always found a way to edify them. There was something apostolic about that man. While St. John had a solid academic foundation in the study of law, his heart led him to serve God. He completed a university formation. He complemented his university formation by a diligent study of the lives of the saints and the prologue, that is, the readings appointed for the daily edification of Orthodox Christians. And because of the tragic events that took place in the aftermath of World War I, Archbishop John emigrated to what was then called Yugoslavia. And under the leadership of Russian church figures and pastors, he joined a monastic community and subsequently was ordained a, uh, ordained a priest. 
In the 1930s, he was elected bishop in order to oversee the Russian immigrant communities in Shanghai, China. A well-known story about his election to the Episcopacy illustrates his character. He met someone on a streetcar in Belgrade or Karlovsky and explained to them that he was in town because they had summoned him by mistake. It was another Hiram John that was to be consecrated as a bishop. And so later, he explained to that person that the matter was far worse than he had first supposed. It was he whom they had elected and who was to be consecrated bishop. And so this gives us some grasp of who he was as a person. He had no problem of responding to a summons to the Holy Synod. He's convinced that it's a mistake and it will soon be clarified. And he clearly feels that there's nothing, that this has nothing to do with him. Now, if he is to be considered filled with presumption, it was a presumption that the election of a new bishop had nothing to do with him. So the grace of God acted mightily in St. John. He worked well with everyone. He established churches and cathedrals. <coughs> he oversaw schools and orphanages. He worked with foundations for refugees and with relief agencies. He addressed governments and lawyers and courts. Above all, St. John is known as a pastor, the good shepherd. He was always present for his flock, and when he was late, or simply didn't show up, it was because he was ministering to his flock. He put the ego to death in order to live for the other, that is, for his neighbor. Now church, new church communities, missions, and converts found in him a guide. He is claimed as the patron for monastic communities, educational programs, and publications. He provided hope for others. And his lifeblood was the daily cycle of services beginning every day with the celebration of the divine liturgy. His day began with the proclamation of the kingdom of God and the celebration of the banquet of the kingdom. And all his other pastoral work flowed from daily worship. Numerous memoirs have been written about St. John, and they focus so often on his visitation of the sick. Now, this is not the way that most bishops normally <coughs> function or administer their dioceses today, but that's not our concern. But it was the concern of St. John. In most church communities, the time immediately after divine liturgy is an opportune time for the priest to meet with everyone, to greet new people, and to instruct his flock. But for St. John, he regularly used this time to visit the homebound and those in hospitals. In this way, he was able daily to prolong his fast and to feed others with the body and blood of Christ before he fed himself. And these actions illustrate the priority that he placed on the well-being of his flock, the well-being of his neighbor. <coughs> he is well known for always having on him the prayer requests that were entrusted to him during the day as an expression of what kind of pastor he was. As a bishop, he placed the well-being of others before his own needs. Many of the people whom I met who knew St. John in China recall how he visited them at the Russian high school in Harbin or Shanghai, how he was present for their tests, how he blessed them at graduation. I became also acquainted with some of the children who had lived for a while in the orphanages that he oversaw. St. John's concern for their well-being and their knowledge of the Orthodox faith remained deeply rooted in their memory. They still cherish a love for Vladika, 
but also an even greater love and dedication to their church. The ministry that St. John began during his life continues after his death. He is known as a saint who heals and to whom people turn for healing. And this is also why it was so important to uncover his relics, make them available for veneration, and celebrate his glorification. Soon after his death, his sarcophagus, it was down in the sepulcher under the cathedral, became a place of pilgrimage, a place of intercession, very similar to the way that the grave of St. Herman of Alaska, after his repose, became a place where people paddled their little boats for miles and miles to come and ask for his prayers. And when his relics were brought up into the cathedral in preparation for his glorification, some people felt a little deprived, deprived of the intimacy that they experienced with him praying alone down below in that sepulcher beneath the cathedral. But the flow of pilgrims to his relics continues and their veneration for St. John has become a powerful ecclesial veneration and not simply someone's personal, private experience. He rests now in the house of God whose construction he oversaw and brought to a finish. And his iconography and his relics continue to renew the iconographic tradition of the church. St. John himself providing the newest subject for this ancient liturgical art form. St. John demonstrates the saints are not necessarily those who lived long ago. God reveals his faithful ones as those who in every age are well-pleasing in his sight. And the apostles are not only those whom Jesus Christ sent forth to the ends of the earth, but whom the Lord, but those men and women whom the Lord chooses today and fills with his grace and sends forth to proclaim a message of love and hope to the ends of the world. St. John is one who was sent. God called him from Ukraine to Yugoslavia. And through the Council of Bishops, the Lord sent him to China, from China to Western Europe, from Western Europe to the United States. And in every place, he preached the gospel, explained the Orthodox faith, established church communities, empowering them to celebrate the divine liturgy in their own language. He prepared and sealed his work through prayer and fasting, and finally laid down his bones in our land. Your community bears the name of St. John. Your community has a legacy in which to participate. The Lord has placed you, entrusted you, to serve the millions of people in this city of Atlanta. He has set you to stand watch here by day and by night. You are to teach your children well, offering them a code to live by. Honor St. John by the daily renewal of the apostolic proclamation of the gospel. Instill in the hearts of your fellow, fellow citizens a longing for God. Visit the sick, feed the hungry, and dispel their fears. Let them know that you love them. And keep the lamps burning, lighting a way to where those who seek the truth can find that treasure that their heart desires. And continue to sing the praises of God, for nothing was so dear to St. John than to be joined together in worship with his flock. To God who has called.